All right. Let's do it. Let's talk about interventions. And let's look at things from the perspective that I think everybody in this room can relate to. Carista Peabody has been working as a nurse at OHSU for over five years and has a passion, her words, for liver disease. She says, seriously, it's her favorite organ. The best part of her job is letting patients know that hepatitis C treatment worked and that they are cured. She attended OHSU and her next step is to start a master's program this fall in health systems and organizational leadership. Please welcome Carista Peabody. Thank you. All right. Yeah, so I know as nurses, we're really good at this presentation stuff. So just bear with me. Um, what I'm really, really hoping, and if you guys can help me with this, is that this is an interactive dialogue. I know you've been already been asking some questions, but I, I really want to know what are you guys seeing in your clinic? What questions do you have about liver disease? Um, if people want to call or email or those kind of things, I'm definitely a resource, and we want to have that collaboration with you in the community. So, all right. So today we're going to be talking about hepatitis C, labs, and monitoring. Um, I'm, I'm just focusing on monitoring my patients while they are on hepatitis C treatment because you guys are going to probably see some patients on these regimens, so just want to touch a little bit of base of what are some of the expected abnormal labs that we'll see cirrhosis, and then the, the last one is the case studies. We've gone through many of these already, so I think this will be a really good cementing of all the information we've already learned today. Okay, so I, I included this slide. One thing that we see a lot in our clinic is that patients get a hepatitis C antibody, and then they're referred automatically to hepatology. And what needs to be done before that, if it's non-reactive, then they don't have an active hepatitis C infection. Their body has naturally been able to clear the, the virus on its own. So I just wanted to kind of, while you're in the primary care clinics, yes, a patient has a hep C antibody positive, but has it had a follow-up RNA done to make sure that they have an active infection? So if it is, look, I'm shaking. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe I'm not gonna use the pointer. So, <laughs> so the, <laughs> the hep C RNA, if it's not detected, then there is no current infection and nothing needs to be done. And, if uh, otherwise, um, if they've uh, had recent drug use or those kind of things, and maybe we, we might consider doing follow-up testing. Um, otherwise, we'll get the viral load. If it's detected, they have an active infection, and that's when it triggers that whole process of, okay, so they have hep C. What stage of their, is their liver scarring? Where do we go from here? Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. So I included this slide. Why do we care about treating hepatitis C. And like Dr. Zaman was saying, hepatitis C by itself, if you have an acute infection, isn't going to cause this scarring. So if you see here, you have your healthy liver. It's really smooth. It has a lot of blood flow going into it. It just looks really awesome. And then as time goes on, we call it the slow burning fire. You just have inflammation, inflammation, inflammation slowly over time causes um, the scarring around the, the hepatocytes. And then as time goes on, it um, progresses to cirrhosis. So we just really want to, um, I just wanted to show you a visual of, of what happens. Um, and then of those patients that develop cirrhosis, I don't know the exact statistics, but I think it might be even 5%, 5 or 10% of patients that have cirrhosis, every year they go on to, de to develop risk of developing liver cancers. So. It's, it's a pretty huge statistic. If you go over time, these patients that develop cirrhosis, we, we don't want them to get there because we don't want them to be at increased risk for these cancers. The other thing we have to be careful about is once you, are cirrhosis, once you have cirrhosis, you are required to get imaging studies and labs every six months until forever, basically. So if you think about just from a health systems standpoint, if we have to get all these advanced imaging, ultrasounds, if we can prevent that then that will be better for our, our health system overall. Any questions about that? Okay. All right. So this is a fiber scan. Have any of you heard of, <coughs> of this technique, of this at all? Okay. So it's, it does not take a, the, uh, doesn't take a picture of the liver itself. It was actually originally made in France to measure the density of cheese. <laughs> and of course, the medical community came up with a way to make money. So they found. <laughs> 
<laughs> that, uh, so what it is, is uh, it's a, a probe that they find, they put it between your ribs. It's kind of like the end of a Bic pin with like an ultrasound probe. And it sends sound waves over the liver. And from that, it correlates even with biopsy with the degree of fibrosis. So when they were doing the evidence for it, they would do the fiber scan and then they would do the liver biopsy and the results were, were very close. Um, this does not, however, replace the need for biopsy in patients that have like autoimmune hepatitis or Wilson's or any of those other non like cirrhotic or um, not non cirrhotic, but um, not hepatitis C, hepatitis B. And the other area where it can get kind of tricky is in our patients with fatty liver disease. The sound wave doesn't travel, it's not quite as accurate, so they're still developing that for fatty liver disease. And um, the other thing that we were gonna point out is, like Dr. Zaman said, a liver biopsy, bleeding risk, infection risk, and it's painful for the patient. I mean, imagine getting a needle stuck into your liver. Obviously, it's not the most comfortable thing. So this is a procedure that's less, I think, around $500, and it allows us to be able to see the level of scarring for the patient. Okay, have any of you ever seen a patient kind of like this? Okay, so we, as we talked already, so you get this really big um, belly, you get the confusion and muscle wasting. I had notes on this, I don't remember what, let me see here. I try to make things simple for my patients, especially with esophageal varices. They're like, how do I have blood vessels that are big in my throat? And how I explain it is that you have the big portal vein. I say it's like a garden hose. And just make it simple, right? So you have all this flow that's going up into an organ that doesn't allow it to perfuse as easily. If you remember back to this slide, see how with the cirrhotic liver, it's not perfusing as well as the healthy liver. So I explained that off of, so you're getting these increased pressures and off of that main vein is the veins that go into your throat and into your spleen. So that's what can cause these esophageal varices. So I just always try to, like, how can I make this simple so someone can picture what's going on in their body? And then jaundice. Um, Dr. Zaman didn't hit on this, but jaundice is a very, very late sign of cirrhosis. You're, I think your bilirubin, even to be able to detect it in the eyes, has to be above six or seven. So, I mean, we're talking people are pretty sick by the time that we're noticing jaundice in them. So I, I think sometimes that's the first thing as a nurse, like, oh, if they have jaundice, they have this. But really, we're going to be looking at all those labs that he talked about. And those are our really first steps to really look at. The ascites? OK, so with the, the ascites, you have this increased, pr I, I do the pressure. You know how he said it could just be the osmotic pressure. But basically, that you have all this built up pressure in your belly and that the veins, the protein leaks out into the abdomen is the oversimplified way I explain it to patients. Anything else? Yes, this is Jackie. So liver failure, the whole family, 42nd case in this one town. Somebody needs to educate these folks about the telltale signs of jaundice. So, <laughs> I, okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> Current prioritization for hepatitis C treatment. So as we've discussed, there are so many barriers to getting patients these cures. Um, I, I get people calling me every day, Krista, what do you mean you don't want me to live? Do you, um, you don't care about me? And I'm like, no, we do care, but we have to treat those with the most advanced scarring. Uh, in our clinic, we prioritize that. So I put people with stage three and four on the same list to treat because we really want them to progress to not progress to that decompensated stage. Because then you're really, you're giving them more quality years of, of life immediately. So that's kind of where we've had to choose as a clinic to do that, which as a nurse is just like <laughs> in my heart. Because, yeah. Yeah. So there's four stages of scarring within the liver. So um, four is cirrhosis. Stage three is, um, what is it? Ad uh, I wish I had the slides. So four. Three is, is basically you still have all that scar tissue, but the hepatocytes are not in, uh, completely encapsulated in scar tissue. So the, the thought is, is that the liver can still regenerate. Um, from stage zero to three, the liver can still heal itself. Whereas once we get to um, stage four, we're worried that there's too much scar tissue. 
Um, as Dr. Zaman was saying, evidence showing maybe that can reverse. Just like when you get a burn on your arm, and over time your body is able to modulate and to, to, to kind of make that scar go away, the hope is, is that the similar process can happen in the liver as well. But, you know, I was just talking with someone about it's evidence-based practice, right? And we know that evidence is always changing, so. Um, and then the other things that we use, uh, that we prioritize is if patients have had hepatocellular carcinoma and that it's treated. So notice the treated portion. If someone has an active, hepatite or active hepatocellular carcinoma, we're not, and we, we're not sure if we're able to treat it, we're not gonna start them on treatment because um, there's really risk for metastasis and all these things. So we just really wanna make sure, and their mortality is less than five years anyway if they have those liver lesions. So we just wanna be really careful about who we're selecting for this. Um, the other group that we really wanna get uh, treated is those with uh, co-infection with hepatitis B and HIV. Because just think about it, you have the slow burning fire and then you add another slow burning fire on it, we're worried about more advanced scarring in the liver and progressing faster. So for example, I have a patient, I think he's around 38 years old. His hep C, hep B, uh, he was an immigrant, probably got it from when he was living there, and he already has cirrhosis. So I mean, just young people, so it's really important um, in those co-infected patients that we are trying to get them access to treatment. So um, what's the rationale for, or is there a rationale beyond prioritizing the patients with Um, so I, I think what you're saying is why aren't we why are we not treating stage zero to two at this time or okay right I think right now it's all about number one resources but number two what Dr. Zaman said that only 20% of people with hep C go on to develop that cirrhosis and so I, I think in five years we're not going to be even having this conversation I, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to get people access, but currently we're like, okay, we know only a certain subset of this population within the next five years is going to develop cirrhosis, so how about we treat, we need to focus our resources on those that are, need, have the most critical need. So does it, like I said, does it feel good? No. But um, our clinics, we do, uh, stage three and four is the priority, like I said, but we do try to get to stage two which is really mild scarring in there as well. Um, I've had a really, really difficult time getting anyone with stage zero or one treated. Um, it's a fight to even get stage three treated, if you can believe it. So just due to the cost and authorization. Um, oh, uh, <laughs> some of them. <laughs> That's a political topic I don't think I don't want to bring up here. <laughs> Yeah, some of the CCOs do have different criteria. There's one in, um, in our community, is the requirement is that patients have tried and failed interferon. And I haven't gotten one patient through them yet. So there's definitely very strict criteria. There's another one in Southern Oregon that has strict criteria, um, no nicotine use. And they want negative uh, drug and alcohol screens every two months for a documented of six months. And um, a lot of my patients smoke marijuana. Mm -hmm. And so having this conversation with patients about, well, this is the only thing I use to help with my pain. Like, you know, I'm not using opioids. And, and our providers, there's, there isn't a lot of evidence that it necessarily causes liver problems. And so it's, it's kind of like this dialogue with patients because you're like, oh, I'm stuck in this middle. And I, I agree. I don't always agree with all the criteria. But that's what the insurance has made as their criteria. So we need to conform to try to get them the treatment they deserve. So, okay, the other thing that can happen with patients with um, hepatitis C is cryoglobulinemia. Has anyone heard that before? What happens is the body um, reacts to the hepatitis C virus and makes proteins, which in turn can cause vasculitis in the legs, can cause um, kidney problems in patients. So we want to get them treated because it can le lead to um, kidney problems and failure. Um, Another one that, it, that some lymphomas are actually linked to the hepatitis C, and vi C virus. I don't know mm -hmm. all the mechanisms, but basically you have this, con your body's always in this constant like fight mode all the time and that, that in turn can um, cause your body to make um, the white cells and mm -hmm. can lead to lymphomas sometimes. And then extra hepatic manifestations including kidney disease and, and PGN. 
So this is what my protocol is for Harvoni. We just changed it about four, actually four weeks ago. Harvoni has been so well tolerated. We used to get labs every two weeks at the beginning, and really I get it four weeks and the end of therapy, and then 12 weeks later, and patients have been doing awesome. So really the most side effects I see is actually a headache with the Harvoni. Some patients uh, describe it as a freight train going through his head. And it's been a couple of patients that have had that, that uh, symptom. And so we've really pushed hydration, keeping um, at least eight to 12 glasses of water a day. And that seems to actually help kind of just flush out of your system for the patients. Um, as you see here, we do two viral loads to see how they're responding to treatment. As uh, she was pointing out, the viral load, I have not seen one viral load for any of these regimens currently that the viral load hasn't. In four weeks, I'll have like 26 million down to less than 300 or even undetected. So I mean, when I was treating with interferon, like we were ex like excited like if it was like a two log drop, like yay, you know what I mean? But it's still under, like 20,000 or whatever. So it's just amazing the differences in these treatments. It's, it's, it's not apples to oranges really. And um, I just included what, what I did if anyone was interested for that. Um, so treatment monitoring. So as she said, there was a new drug that just came on the market. Uh, it's, it's actually Zepatir, but we like to say Zepatier, <laughs> and uh, Decladisvir, uh, Vicira, and Ribavirin. So these ones I monitor a lot more closely. With the Harvoni, we actually give patients the two refills that they need. So we actually don't um, limit them, but with the Ribavirin, and these medications, just because I don't know what's going on with their liver, we don't feel comfortable just giving them the full script. <laughs> so um, the Vicura, one thing that we've really noticed with, we have to be careful is that there can be a spike in the bilirubin within one or two weeks of starting it. And uh, we did actually have two patients decompensate and we develop jaundice and we had to stop therapy with the Vicura. So it's really, really important that we're not using this in patients that are on that cirrhotic border because it's just not safe for them. Um, so with this, we'd get labs every two weeks for the first month and then monthly thereafter. So, and this is the protocol that we have. There's something else with labs that I wanted to mention. Oh, I think I already mentioned about the ribavirin that we do expect to drop. Um, have any of you had patients on treatment or that you've seen their labs at all or not really? Okay, so I've just gotten some calls about that. I guess maybe, maybe one more thing about labs, not related to treatment, but as Dr. Zaman was saying, um, these patients with cirrhosis and hepatitis C get that pancytopenia. So our providers, again, we don't um, transfuse if the platelets are um, low. It's very normal for cirrhotic patients. I think the average that I see is platelets 40 to 60. Like if I see anything above 150, I think something's wrong because I'm so used to seeing sick labs. So um, that is something that is to be expected. But it, um, sometimes we'd still have them get a hematology consult because you can just never be too careful just to make sure that they're okay. I was just wondering which med you would use for the HIV positive Harvoni. Yeah. I, I thought I saw one of the handouts that you couldn't be on the HIV med at Did, the same time. I think, well, because the Vicure has way more drug side effects, especially with HIV, you're going to run into a lot more complications. With the Harvoni, you can probably switch one over and you'll be able to treat. Does, can anyone else speak to that? Um, she actually asked me, and I can answer the question, but we looked it up and it is Harvoni. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we typically treat. We haven't had a lot of HIV patients because the infectious disease doctors do treat a lot of their patients. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Well, and any re the regimen with Ritonavir is probably going to be. Exactly. Contraindicated. Um, what's really cool is in this summer, there's another, this is moving so fast, but we are getting another regimen later this summer that's supposed to be pan genotypic, so it can treat all genotypes, and I think it might even be one, just one pill a day as well. That's also from Gilead. So this is like a hot place to be, which is kind of fun that I'm having to learn all the time because it's changing so fast. So. Okay, so this is a trick question, but if you could all read this. So we have four patients, and these are pretty typical patients that we see in our clinic. So if you want to read over that. So 62-year-old male, previous IV drug user, um, his hep C antibody is positive. Oh, I didn't change this one. Oops. 
that this is confusing. I, w I changed my slide to say um, hepatitis B DNA is 10,000 because that this is a trick question. Hep B <laughs> antigen is actually for patients that have an active hepatitis B infection and they're in the re fast replication, so they're making a lot of virus. So that was my nerdy hepatology ness, and I deleted it on my other slide. So sorry about that. And then. Um, the ultrasound shows heterogeneous echotexture, which, as Dr. Zaman said, is consistent with cirrhosis, and splenomegaly. His platelets are 56. Um, the second patient we have is a 28-year-old female, hep C antibody positive, hep C viral load is weak positive, ultrasound shows homogeneous, which means that it's smooth, everything looks good, so doesn't point to cirrhosis, and an ALT of 70. Um, C, a patient is 52 years old, uh, had a needle stick injury, hep C antibody positive, viral load is 2.2 million, and cryoglobulin screen is positive. Liver biopsy shows that they are stage three, which is the um, more advanced scarring. And then D, we have a 40-year-old male, uh, viral load is 15,000, and patient has cirrhosis and treated cancer. So I went, depending on what we said, how many of you think that it might be A? Would this be the patient that we need to treat? No one? <laughs> B? C? Okay. And then D. Okay. So basically it was a trick question because all A, C, and D <laughs> are all have the priority to treat. So it's actually E, A, C, and D. So the only patient where we wouldn't have priority is this one here, because we, we don't know what her actual viral load is. Like, I don't know if she um, just had a weak positive. I don't know where, where, what her actual infectious state is going to be. So any questions about that? Okay. All right. Does someone want to read this for me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Frank, um, so this is a fatty liver. I just thought I would show, like, it's kind of... If you think about the healthy liver cells being replaced by fat, it's pretty cool. All right. <laughs> I know. I don't know. Like I said, the liver is my favorite organ. I don't, it's so it's awesome. So, Frank, and this is based off of a real life case study. Um, I I had this patient. He was suffering from a lot of depression, but also a lot of hepatic encephalopathy. And we're trying to find that balance. Is this depression? Is this hepatic encephalopathy? So this is where this kind of came from. So a 56-year-old man with fatty liver disease and cirrhosis suffers from depression. His family has noticed over the last couple of days that he is not getting out of bed and is increasingly um, somnolent. While triaging the call, the patient is oriented self and place, but not time. Family also endorses he hasn't taken any medications. What do you do? And I'm just going to sit here until someone helps. <laughs> Sometimes. But a lot of what we do is over the phone. Yeah. So that would be the first thing, is I want to see what, what is their hydration sta status, and then has he taken his lactulose. The goal for these patients is that they are having three to four loose bowel movements a day, which is um, really hard. The lactulose, have, I, I've, I've tried it just to be like, yeah, I've tried this. It tastes like dusty sugar cubes, and it's like, and it causes a lot of bloating um, and a lot of gas in patients, so it's not comfortable for them to take. Um, some strategies is um, mixing it with a little bit of Sprite with a straw so you don't actually taste it and it's kind of a little bit more bubbly. That's one of the things that we've tried for patients to try to get it down. Um, the other thing that we want to do, sometimes if, if I know the patient and I know that they're kind of, they flip in and out of the hepatic encephalopathy because they're not being adherent with medications, this is where that nursing assessment becomes really fine. So what I'll do sometimes is with this, with this gentleman, um, he wasn't oriented to himself, but what I'll do is like, okay, take one dose of lactulose. If he hasn't had a bowel movement in an hour, let's take a second dose of lactulose and, if, and see if he's improved. If within three hours they haven't improved, then I send them off to the emergency department. But we kind of have this fine window where we can do that because basically what they'll do in the ER is get him fluids and push the lactulose. So if we can try to manage these patients by making sure that they're staying compliant with their medications, we really want to encourage that as well. So. It's, it's kind of tricky as nurses because you don't want, I, 
I don't know, does anyone else struggle with that? Like, you're like, when do I send them? When do I not? When is it safe to be home? Well, I think here, too, he has family yep. in the house. So mm -hmm. looking at their social supports and our, our family reliably able to monitor symptoms and changes versus someone who's at home alone, there's mm -hmm. a much lower threshold for bringing them in the clinic. Exactly. Exactly. <coughs> um, have any of you had patients with encephalopathy? Or in, yeah, tell me about that one. Well, we have patients that are cirrhosis and significant liver failure, but uh, they're not as they compensated with too much that the site is. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, uh, they don't take their lot mm -hmm. and they come and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, we'll do what we generally suggest that we can bring them in, run some labs, and uh, try to talk to them about why they're not taking them in. So that's what we're trying to help them to understand the regime. So, uh, and they're like, can I just take that pill? I'm like, yes, you can have the pill, but we have to show that you fail lactulose first before your insurance will pay for it. You know what I mean? So it's just like that, that continual discussion with people. Um, uh, what was the other thing? Let's see. I don't remember. Oh, talking about the Zyfaxin. A lot of our patients will actually have beyond Zyfaxin and the lactulose together if, if it gets pretty bad. So typically, you can either be on lactulose or the Zyfaxin, but as patients' liver disease progresses, we do do a dual therapy to help with those side effects for sure. Okay. I have a quick question. Do you yeah. have any support group? We don't. At the OHSU? We no. don't currently. I, that's something I would love to be able to do. I think we used to have one for hepatitis C, and it kind of fizzled out. It kind of came a session where people would just come and talk about their woes, but it wasn't always uh, the most supportive for patients, and so I, I, that was before I even came, so I haven't tried it. But we're talking about doing group teaches for hepatitis C, even like um, before we even prescribe, so that's something I'm looking into doing so that patients kind of know what the regimens are and what to kind of as expect, so that's something that we're, it's in development, as we all know, we have lots of time, right, in our day to make those yeah. programs. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, we're, it's definitely a passion, though, because people need the, that su the emotional support. It's really important. That's one of the things with this guy. I actually got uh, had him get involved with the with the mental health practitioner because a lot of he, he I mean he was looking at cirrhosis. He was full of ascites. His was actually from from fatty liver, and so he had this like I did this to myself. I knew that I needed to control my di diabetes better and all these like guilt. And I'm like, you know what, Frank, like this the, the, we are where we are now, and we need to you know move forward and let's get you the help that you need. And so. It's not just managing patients' disease processes, but their mental health is so important, especially as their liver disease progresses, because you have like the night day switches, and it's just it's just a lot to manage. So trying to get them that emotional support can be really great for them. Okay, anything else? Okay. So this is not a small esophageal varicy. Just wanting to point that out. My 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 slide says small, but this is a pretty large one that they would actually probably band. So. I think it sounds, it's so crazy that they go in with this machine and just like shoot rubber bands at these esophageal varices. So if someone had this big of an esophageal varice, just a note for you guys, um, they should get a follow-up within a month and get a repeat endoscopy. So, so just to point that out, because you might see, oh, a patient was hospitalized recently for, for a GI bleed. You know how people fall through the system. So just wanting to really make sure that they are having follow-up on that banding so that they're so that we're actually eradicating the varices and have them being in contact with us or their GI provider is really important. Okay, so we kind of already talked about the natalol. Um, in our clinic, our pri uh, the medication we use most is natalol. Um, it's pretty well tolerated. Like we said, the most common side effects are uh, dizziness, um, withstanding, um, low heart rate. But the real goal is to get our heart rate between 50 and 60 beats per minute, which sounds pretty low, but if, if it's above that, it's not gonna be therapeutic for the patient. So I, we always have them take it before they go to bed. So some patients will take it in the morning, but the best time, because you're gonna get the least side effects from it, right? So you're gonna sleep off most of it. Why we like the natalol is it's one pill a day, or two, depending on the dosing. Whereas with like the carvedilol and the, is it propranolol? It's split dosing, and it's just hard for patients to really be compliant with that. So it's really important to, um, get patients on medications they'll actually take. <laughs> so um, let me see here. Okay, so we start them on 20 milligrams. The provider starts them on natalol. 
<coughs> so the patient calls the following week, and his heart rate has been the following. So what do you think the next step will be? I can't increase the dose, but I can talk to the provider about increasing the dose, right? But my other question, when did they take their heart rate? Do we know? It doesn't say. So I always have patients take their resting heart rate before they ever even get out of bed. So that's like a true resting heart rate. So I say keep a little pad of paper by your bed, me measure your heart rate for a minute, and then write it down. So basically, it's kind of like it's the last thing you take before you go to bed, and it's the first thing you do when you wake up. So we can really see what their patterns are with their, with their natal law. Because the, the whole point is if they're taking a medication, it should be therapeutic. Right? So what, if, if their heart rate is in the 70s, then this is not decreasing their risk for GI bleeds. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Okay. This is my typical lovely patient. So a patient with fatty liver disease cirrhosis again, getting the paracentesis every two weeks. Their uh, kidney function is in the tank. Their creatinine is at 2.7, and uh, they're not on any diuretics because of this. Patient reports being on a low-sodium diet. Upon further discussion, I don't add salt to anything, but I love pickles. <laughs> and canned soups are convenient. What dietary uh, tips would you advise for this patient? <laughs> it happens so often, right? So um, I really encourage food journaling and, and looking at label. And we tell patients that, but when they're literally writing them down and like cottage cheese has more, I can't remember how much it has in it, but it has way more than you would think. So these low salt that people think are fine, they're really going over what, what their dose, sh or the 2,000 milligrams. And as Dr. Zaman says, I just follow him, but 1,500 milligrams, because that equals 2,000 in real life, right? Um, what else do we do for this patient? Um, let me see here. Oh, that was the other thing I was going to talk about. Um, so patients are, sometimes get these taps every two weeks, and sometimes we don't need them that frequently because, like, well, I'm big and I'm, I'm uncomfortable, but we want their belly to be, like, like tense, like top of the table, because every time you put that needle in, you're re in introducing them to bleeding risk and infection. So we want it to be firm and slight shortness of breath at rest, which is not comfortable for most people to wait till. So... Um, and if we can, you know, have them see their GI specialist, because if they go to the ER, they take two to three liters off, and the patient's back within a week. Whereas if we go to, like, interventional radiology, I have patients get 15 to 17 liters off sometimes. I mean, like, literally way more. And the other thing when they go to interventional radiology is we uh, replace their albumin. And so when they go to the ER, they just take the two to three liters off. The albumin is never replaced. And that's just shown over, our providers believe, that it protects the kidneys over time. Because you can have this accumulation over time. I can't remember how many milligrams. I think, so for every four liters, we rec so for every liter over, every liter over four liters, we give them two grams of albumin. So to help them. And the thought as well is that will help maybe with the osmotic pressure as well to decrease the slide right back in. So, yeah. I've seen some kind of patients are stuck. So tips, the tips procedure. Yeah. Does anyone know what tips is? It's a, it's a basically a shunt that goes from the liver right into the heart. We have to be really careful with these patients because if their kidney function isn't doing so well, we have to be very careful because we don't want to number one put more strain on the kidneys and number two put more strain on their heart. So there's a lot of workup that has to be done before we just put a shunt in to a patient so yeah but no we do have patients get tips all the time as well um, but again we have to make sure that they don't have any heart or kidney issues typically um, okay anything else on that okay do you work with palliative very much uh, so we, we do yeah we do um, at OHSU we're blessed to have a palliative care team so we can actually co make consults with them and I always try to talk to them about just because you're seeing a palliative care team does not mean that this is end of life, that this is just a way, another team to help you manage all of your health issues. Um, as we all know, and I feel this way too, like 
I'm focused on such a small organ and I'm like, you're a whole person. And so trying to, that's when I refer to you guys actually as primary care providers is to, to help with that. I, I feel like I'm always like, well, you have swelling in your arm. I need you to go see your primary. So I really rely on the primary clinics. And how, how are you guys finding that to be like with all these pushing demands from patients? How do you, how do you manage everything? <laughs> that's what I'm like. I'm like, I'm dealing with a small organ and I'm like barely making it sometimes. So how do you, how do, you do that as teams or... What have you guys found to be helpful in managing these complex patients? <laughs> so it's that ping pong game, isn't it? That's what I feel like sometimes. That we're in this big game, and then unfortunately the patient is the, the ball that's in the middle of the paddles. So I, I'm definitely wanting to work on that collaboration piece. That's really, really important. So, okay. I think what's really helpful is when the special team clinics are really communicative with us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Great. So, do you guys want to know even um, like when we make medication changes, or like how how detailed is it? Is it ever any information is be is better basically, or? Yes, exactly. I know our physician working. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or monitoring or later. Mm -hmm. Okay. You don't know. It's the squeaky wheel, right? It gets the grease. Like that's how. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, one of the things, not related to the CITES, but just to really drive home the the collaboration when patients are on diuretics of furosemide and spironolactone because that's when we get the best results. So I'll get patients in, they'll be on 160 of furosemide and no spironolactone. And then they're on potassium replacement therapy. <laughs> and it's like, oh, we have a way to affect you know, the swelling in different places in the kidney and to give, they can be on lower doses of everything basically and not causing so much strain on those kidneys. So, okay. I don't know I include so many pictures of the liver, but just to really drive home. So this one's really, really nodular do you see like and shrunken and um, so one of the things that we see a lot is patients are like yeah I'm cured see ya and we're like oh wait no like you have cirrhosis so we still need to see you so even after they get the hepatitis C cure if they have stage zero to three we do say bye been nice taking care of you but if any patients have cirrhosis, it's still important that they are getting screening every six months. This is one part that I, I, I kind of need your guys' help with this because sometimes patients don't come back in our clinic and you guys are actually seeing them in the community, but making sure that they are getting ultrasounds or CTs of their liver every six months to make sure that they don't have liver cancers. Um, we've seen a lot of our patients, we've treated them for hepatitis C and three or four months later they develop a cancer. So just because the hepatitis C is gone, don't forget that they still have that advanced scarring. So to be mindful of that. Um, and as we were saying, hepatitis C does not reverse cirrhosis, but um, what we can do is have a non-invasive way again with the fiber scan to see what degree of scarring they have one year after they're treated is recommended that they come in to have that done to see if, there's, if they've gone maybe even down to stage three. Um, like Dr. Zaman was saying, um, people when they're on that stage three, four border, most likely they will reverse. So we really just want to follow up with them on that. So, any questions about any of this? Has this been helpful at all? Okay. I'm just wondering about the efficacy of uh, CP versus MRI. <clears throat> so it just depends. Um, people have concerns, well, CT, I'm getting exposed to, to um, radiation, well, whereas the, the CT of the abdomens are with and without IV contrast so that you can see the vascular phases of it. 
No oral contrast is indicated in those studies. Um, MRIs um, are also just as, are as fine, but sometimes we'll do both depending if there's actually a liver lesion. But typically the first method, if, if we don't think that a patient has cancer, we're just doing screening as the CT because uh, just due to cost. There is the, there is the issue of and renal failure, exactly. But actually, ultrasounds have actually been shown if you get the right radiology person doing It's all about where you go, right? What's, what is the quality of the radiologist reading it and also the quality of the exam? I've seen studies where you are looking through like impacts, which is our radiology, and we're like, this is, I don't even know what this is. Like, it's just muddy and you can't see a good picture. Whereas I've seen some that's just an ultrasound and it's just like you can see automatically. So it's about the skill of the people doing the scan. So ultrasounds can be just as effective as CTs in detecting something abnormal. And then from there, move to more advanced imaging. We used to alternate CT ultrasound, CT ultrasound, and recently in the last year we've moved to primarily ultrasound first. And if there's abnormality, proceed with CT. <coughs> okay, questions? Okay. Nothing? Really? Okay. <laughs> Good. Oh, well, it was so nice meeting with all of you, and I, um, again, if you have any questions, um, email me, or um, it'd be good to continue that relationship. So we are here to help. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm.